Now, dear audience, it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome our keynote speaker, a trailblazer in digital democracy, the Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, to join us for discussion. Minister, can you hear us well? Yes, um, and can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Yeah, perfect. Um, many thanks for such an inspiring speech. Uh, we are very um, excited to see and hear what, he, what you're doing at the moment to democratize AI futures together with citizens. Um, we are now very interested in learning more how you build bridges between the government and citizens. And we are also very eager to learn how you have utilized technology in this process. And we, are also, yeah, we also look forward to, to learning how other democracies can benefit from your insights and ex experiences. So now it is our time for, for a Q&A session. Mm -hmm. And um, prior to this event, we have asked our audience to send in questions for you, Minister Tang. And I will now start by asking two of these questions. And afterwards, the audience uh, will have the op opportunity to, to post their questions to you. Yes, perfect. <laughs> so the first question goes, from your point of view, what are the biggest obstacles in implementing and testing democracy technologies usually? And how have you tackled them? This is a great question. Um, consider if we talked about Uber in a very abstract way, say let's deliberate about sharing economy, then usually that goes nowhere because it means different things to different people. Some people prefer to call it gig economy or extractive economy or whatever, right? But uh, in actual fact, in 2015, we talked about a very specific case, which is UberX, people with no professional driver license, picking up strangers, they meet on the app, on the way to work multiple times a day and charging them for it. So whenever there is a specific case that links people's first-hand experiences, it creates the conditions for uh, overlapping consensus. So issue selection and clarification is key because the wicked problem do not lend to easy solutions. Only by linking the wicked problem into something all the participants can feel uh, that their first-hand experience connects to, can we actually do a uh, collective intelligence exercise that converges? Uh, if it is too abstract, it diverges. Um, automatically almost. So in summary, the issue defines the possibility of success of democracy technology. That's very interesting. Um, now I'd like to ask a second question, which is about inclusion. So um, the discussion may become very narrow if only digitally skilled and wealthy individuals participate in societal decision making. It may not be recognized um, who is excluded from societal influence and conversation. So um, the question goes, how can we effect effectively enable participation of people with different skill levels? And also, um, yeah, how, how can we um, effectively enable the participation of people with different skill levels in societal discussion through technology? And how can we ensure that democracy technology does not become solely a pathway for those who are all already digitally skilled. Um, in addition to making sure that broadband is a human right uh, in Taiwan and that the basic and lifelong education contains competence, that's to say participatory capabilities, not just literacy, which is consuming um, ways. The idea here is to build upon the broadband as human right and competence so that people closest to the pain engage the democratic technologists on their own terms. This is to say, if they prefer, uh, their community prefer a face-to-face -face deliberation setting, then we bring the conversation to them. If the people already gathers in some way that's recognized, as legitimate by a community is we, the ministers and uh, administrators that go to them. If they're too far away, we send uh, a small team and then use uh, real-time live streaming as we're doing now to connect the experiences together. But all in all, as we have seen uh, in the development on AI and many emerging technologies, if we do not intentionally make the technology fit 
the people's norms of conversation, it almost automatically excludes uh, people who do not have the um, kind of a habit of uh, interacting with technology in the specified way. So in the long term, I believe the education system itself is of greatest importance instead of um, teaching students to fit into a system of communication of symbols or whatever that teachers prefers, we need to flip this around and make sure that the students with very diverse different interaction patterns and modalities can set their own terms on how to interact with the world and develop assistive technologies such as real-time translation, interpretation, carrying the new ones, cultural translation, and so on to bridge that divide. So it is a very different way to think about technology for it to fit the societal need rather than asking the society to adapt. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, now, dear audience, I'll give the floor to you. So if you have questions, yeah, oh, there's already one. You can go ahead. Um, dear Mr. Tang, uh, I don't know if you can see me or just hear me, but um, it's such an honor to meet a fellow uh, techie. And I say this in the most respectful way. Uh, I'm the founder, my name is Alice Stolmeyer. I'm the founder and executive director of an NGO called Defend Democracy. And um, on my recent visit to Taiwan, I had the pleasure to have some very inspiring meetings with civil society. Now, one of them even described me as a hacker, which I took as a big compliment. <laughs> um, so just to make clear, I really love tech. But, uh, you know, being a philosopher of technology by um, education and uh, a defender of democracy, like you and many others, I'm very concerned about the bigger picture of how digital and uh, technological transitions are uh, impacting our societies. Um, especially if we allow the big tech uh, firms to design and deploy new technologies uh, without even the most basic of safety features. Now, Minister Tang, my question is, is, let's say, good tech still outweighing bad tech? And if so, how can we make sure it stays that way? For example, how can we make sure that, you know, that, that that we align the, the technologies, uh, sorry, the policies that are regulating technology. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I can talk about for this um, idea for like two hours, but we have two minutes. Uh, so to long story short, I believe that the goodness of technology is judged by how much it frees the future. That is to say it should not foreclose future possibilities. Any technology can be deployed in a centralizing authoritarian fashion, even by the best well-intentioned technologists who simply want to connect everybody's touch screen to everybody else's touch screen. And we know how good uh, it sounded right uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but without the ability for people on the receiving end to remix, to adapt, to voice harm and also to redress the harm by remixing, then it is almost impossible for the centralizing forces technologists to listen to the actual harm and suffering that their technologies have caused uh, to the world, even as simple as a like button. So I think the point I'm making is that we need to design technology such that anytime it doesn't fit, right? Assistive technology, right? If the uh, eyeglass doesn't fit, I can adjust it, I can uh, correct its bias, I can uh, take it to a repair person down the street, I don't have to sign an NDA and pay 2 million euros. Uh, and we trust the people closest to the pain to remix the technology. And no matter how crude it seems at the beginning, at the end, I sincerely believe that this kind of co-creative appropriate technology will win at the end. And we are seeing that trend now 
uh, with Edge AI, with open source, zero knowledge models, and so on that I have talked uh, in my keynote. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about the ability for the collective intelligence to remix the tools of social production. Uh, this will. Th thank you. That's. Uh, it's. It's good to have uh, some uh, hopeful uh, answer. And uh, yes, I look forward to working on cautious optimism. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think we have time for for one more question still, and I can see one hand raised there. Uh, thank you so much, Minister Tang, for your inspiring presentation and insights. Uh, my name is Joana Saitlanurmi and I come from the Finnish Digital Agency and my question is like continuum to others' previous questions. Uh, the question is, have the lives of future generations already been lived for them? I'm thinking about kids today and future generations of AI and uh, endless data points and other emerging technologies. Uh, they need to learn specific skills to live in an AI-mediated world where there is no boundary between the real world and the virtual world. Everyday life is more and more data-driven and especially predictive in the future, I assume. On top of that, as uh, you said, and it's been mentioned, uh, the divide between democracy and autocracy seems to be deepening only, and which is, of course, important considering socio-technological transformations and governance of digitalization. So my question for you is, uh, is life already lived for the coming generations? Thank you. Not at all, and which is why our slogan is free the future. We need to free the future generations. I have talked about this at length uh, with Yuval Harari uh, in two different podcast episodes. And the main idea is that the AIs or whatever predictive technology need to be deployed like a, a good enough uncle, good enough aunt, good enough parent and so on, uh, who offers advices and for children uh, growing to be adolescent, to be adult, um, their parents and their extended family can offer them advices, but there are varieties in such advices. And more importantly, uh, the child is free to align, to fine tune uh, those adults' responses as well, instead of um, a exploitative uh, extended family or parents that only uh, live the child's life, plan it for them and so on, and only indoctrinate, uh, which is the kind of relationship you just, um, just described. So my point is uh, twofold. One, that we always need to, at a policy level, make sure that it is the dignity of the people taking the final control of how the technology is used in the last mile. And the second, is that we need to increase the bandwidth of democracy to do it continuously, not once every four years, but once every four minutes, so that we can have our collective preferences reflected in the real-time responses in the design of such technologies. Great, he showed you a thumbs up. <laughs> so now we have unfortunately used all of our time. So let's give a big applause so our insightful female speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And live long and prosper. I wanted to say that to you as well. <laughs> and greetings to Taiwan. <laughs>